Welcome to another session. I'm super excited that everyone's here. I hope you're all having a great week. We are excited for this seminar. We hope it's going to be a blessing and absolutely super excited. Um, Lord Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this meeting that you're enabling us to attend, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we know that you know every single person's heart, Lord Jesus. Everyone that's attending, Lord, you know what they're thinking, Lord, and what they're feeling, Jesus. And Lord, we know, Lord, that you're going to be using the speaker today, Jesus, that we may hear what we need to hear, Jesus, and that we may learn something new about you, Lord Jesus, who you are, Lord, and the word, Jesus. Lord, strengthen us today, Jesus, and ready our hearts, Lord, that we may be able to understand what is being heard, Jesus, and that we may use that, Lord Jesus, in our lives, Lord Jesus. But I ask you in your name to bless every person that's listening, Jesus, to bless the speaker, Lord, and the people that arranged this meeting, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, Lord, during this quarantine time, Lord Jesus. What you're doing, Lord Jesus, when the whole world is panicking, Lord Jesus. You are the one that's keeping us together and giving us strength to keep going, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I give you thanks, Lord, and I praise you, Lord, for all the things that you're doing, Jesus, that will glorify your name, Lord. Lord, before this meeting ends, Jesus, help all of us to have changed in some kind of way, Lord that our thinking in some kind of, in one area would have changed Jesus. And Lord, I believe, Lord, that through this meeting, we'll all be one step closer to you, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that this meeting will glorify your name, Jesus. That this meeting will be something that will help us all to grow spiritually, Lord Jesus. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, and enlighten thank us, you, Jesus, Lord. because we want to press on to know you better, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you once again for thank all your praise, you. Lord for bringing us together, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Next speaker is Dr. Shilpa Lukos. Uh, she's the wife of Dr. Shibu Lukos, and they have been blessed with three wonderful daughters and living in Kettering. She works as a pharmacist, as a pharmacy manager with Tesco since 2016. She completed her pharmacy training in India, came to the UK in 2002, Later, by the grace of God, successfully completing the laborious task to meet the requirements to work as a pharmacist in the UK. She is the daughter of Pastor Babu John and Sissy Babu John, both of whom are being used mightily for the glory of God. And we're super excited and we're so glad to have you. And I hand it over to you. The life of Moses, the making of a great intercessor. So that is my topic. So once again, thank you, ICP of Barras, ICP of UK. Thanks goes to you. So my topic today, I would like to start by quoting Charles Spurgeon's quote, where he says, I would rather teach one man to pray than 10 men to preach. One is to 10 ratio. That is the importance of prayer. Five friends, they were visiting London one day. So they thought to go and visit Charles Spurgeon's church. They thought they wanted to meet the man himself. So they went to this church. They were greeted by the man himself. And they started asking him questions. They were very curious. So they started asking him, what's the secret behind all your meetings, your preachings, your teachings? And you know, Charles Spurgeon said, I, let, I will lead you into the secret. And he took them downstairs and he opened a door and he told them, there is my healing heating plant. That is where my success is. Do you know what it was? 700 people bowing down and praying for the meeting, for the successful meeting that was about to happen. That is where prayer is. And that is the importance of a successful prayer. And that was his success. I want to say about another man, that is, you all have been to Muller House, I think, in Bristol. And George Muller, he was a great man of God, a Christian evangelist. He had five friends. And he always close friends, you know, and he used to pray for them to come to know Christ. And one of them came to know God within a few months. Two of them came to know God after 10 years. And the fourth one came to know God after 25 years. And do you know the fifth one? Uh, he was not even alive to see the fifth one coming to Christ, but he gave his life to Christ at his funeral. But 
George Muller was so persistent in prayer. He kept on praying. That is the attitude we should have. And I'm sure they will both meet in eternity. And coming lastly to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, he went and was praying. His sweat was like blood. And God kept praying and praying. And when he came back, Peter, James, and John were sleeping. And he was asking them, could, not, could you not tarry with me at least for an hour? Look at God asking them, at least for an hour. That is the importance of prayer. And you know what God was doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? He was praying so that we won't fall into temptation. He was praying for Peter who was going to, uh, he was praying for Judas who was going to betray him. He was going to pray for Peter who was going to deny him three times. He was praying that his disciples won't get into temptation. Christ was praying so that the unbelieving world will come to know the Father. So Christ was praying and he came back and he said three words, watch and pray, watch and pray watch and pray. That is the importance of prayer in today's world. And coming to the life of Moses, I will easily breeze through about Moses. He was born to Jewish parents and uh, his father was a Levite. His name was Amram and the wife's uh, name was Jochebed. And he had an elder brother, Aaron, who was the high priest. And he had a sister who was a great worship leader, who was Miriam. And then comes the beautiful baby boy, Moses. And we know the king had a decree to throw all the male boys into the river Nile. And you know, the river Nile is full of crocodiles and how God protected Moses in the Moses basket made by his mother and sister. That's what I believe. And we know the Pharaoh's daughter, she comes for a dip. She opens the basket, sees this beautiful kid, takes him to the palace. And there Moses is growing up as Pharaoh's daughter's son. And he's well versed in Egyptian We're so good. years palace, but you you know the good things which has, he was nursed by his mom, so he had all the good qualities and Christian values instilled into him by his godly parents. And one day he sees the Egyptian fighting with an Israelite, and deep down he knew he was an Israelite. And he is seeing the fight and he kills the Egyptian, and he's scared for his life and he flees away. He goes to Midian, and there he meets Jethro and he marries Jethro's daughter Zipporah. They have two kids, and one day he was grazing all the sheep and he was doing that in Horeb. Horeb means it's a place dry desolate land and there he sees a good vision and he's seeing a burning burnt and it's not being consumed so he was fascinated and he goes near to see what is happening and when Moses approaches this uh, burning bush you can see God calling him twice Moses Moses and he's responding here I am so I always say in prayer there should be three asks First is our response to God. I always say our God is a chatterbox. He likes to chat. Prayer is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. There, there is us talking to God and God talking to us. So he's such a chatterbox. He wants to have such a communion with us and communication with us. God likes to talk. So in prayer, there should be a response. And God is the initiator of the con conversation here. And secondly, there should be a relationship. God is saying, Moses, I am the God of your father. I am the God of your grandfather. I am the God of your great grandfather. And I want to be your God now. So look at the relationship God is speaking to him. And thirdly, there should be a reverence, the three R's. Reverence means there should be a holy fear we should have. We should uh, give respect that is due unto God. And God is saying, look, Moses, the place where you're standing, it's a holy ground. Take off your sandals. And God is saying, look, I've heard my people cry. I've heard my, I've seen my people's cry and I've come down to deliver them. Here you can see the omnipotence, the omniscience and the omnipresence of God. What an amazing God who likes to talk to his people. So that is the third element. That is a reverence that we should see. So there is nine aspects to the making of an intercessor. The first step is God is telling Moses, I've seen you as a deliverer for this people Israelite. And then the first excuse. There are five excuses that Moses gives in prayer. We all fall into one of these five categories. Either when our pastor uncle asks us something or when one of our believers asks us something, we all like to give this five lame excuses. Either one of them will fall into. So we can see a Moses, a fearful baby infant Moses. And that's the first recorded prayer of Moses where we see. And he was 80 years of age when he was seeing this vision. And the first excuse that he gives us in Exodus 3 chapter 
chapter, uh, third chapter, verse 11, it says, Moses is saying, I'm insignificant, Lord. No one will notice me. And God is saying, no, Moses, I'm going to be with you. And the second excuse he gives us, chapter 3, verse 13. Moses is saying, Lord, I'm ignorant. I don't know what to do and say when these people are going to fire questions at me. And God was telling Moses, I will tell you what you have to tell them. And the third excuse Moses gives is, Lord, I'm important. I can't persuade this generation. That is in chapter 4, verse 1. And God is saying, my power will be with you and I'll do miracles through you. And his fourth excuse is Moses is saying that he's incompetent and he's not eloquent enough. You know, he has a stammering tongue. And I love the verse which says chapter four, verse 11. It says, God is telling him and asking him a question. It's so beautiful. Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the blind, the seeing? Have not I the Lord? How beautiful it is. And then we can see the fifth excuse Moses is giving. Oh Lord, I'm so irrelevant. Find somebody else, send somebody else. And God is saying, no, I'm going to give you Aaron, your brother. He's going to be your mouthpiece. And God just is patient and he's angry, you know? I always, just being honest in his prayer, it was full of questions, excuses, everything. God doesn't give us the job we are fit for. Rather, he fits us for the job he gives us. And secondly, the second stage is the self-conscious stage. It's all about I. I, I, me, me, me. And thirdly, the third stage is he gets impatient. In, you know why? Because Pharaoh gets wind of the situation and he makes it so hard for the Israelites. He doesn't give them straw. They have to dig clay out of the ground and make the brick. And Moses is saying, God, why did you choose me? Why are you bringing all this calamity upon this people? And he's saying, Lord, I'm not Jewish enough to convince this Israelites. And I'm not Egyptian enough to convey to Pharaoh or to communicate with him. And he's saying, Lord, you have got me all bungled up. Sometimes, you know, when you try to help a situation, you make it worse. And then God is telling Moses, 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 you're just looking at the current situation. Look at the bigger perspective. I have got higher plans. You are just looking at the situation that is happening around and you're whinging and whining. No, no, no. God said, I'm going to send 10 plagues. And you know, the last 10th plague was the killing of the firstborn. So the fourth prayer aspect of Moses is, in prayer, Moses is giving orders. You know, a king, Pharaoh, who was so stone-hearted and hard-hearted, he is coming and asking for Moses' prayer. So there are two remarkable things that happens in prayer. Moses uh, is, has been asked to pray over a uh, rude king, that is the Pharaoh. And then we can see Moses performing miracles. That is the fourth aspect of an intercessory prayer warrior. And coming to the fifth aspect, I always say that is the highest form of praise. You know, these people came to Rephidim and the Israelites are very good grumblers. They are They've got PhD in grumbling. That's what I always say. They like to grumble and moan and whinge and whine. And they are, uh, now they are moaning and grumbling against Moses because they're so thirsty and they're not getting any water. So, you know, if it was the old Moses, he would have said, why Lord? Why me? Why? Every question would be raised against God. But now what Moses is saying is, what can I do about this situation? And he's looking at himself. The people hasn't changed. The circumstance hasn't changed. What changed was his prayer life you know, and it's so beautiful. And I always say the highest form of prayer is praise and thanksgiving. There is a difference between praise and thanksgiving. Praise is giving the praise, knowing who God is and giving him the due respect. You know, he's the alpha, he's the omega, he's my grand designer, he's my redeemer, he's my deliverer. There's so many things. There are 26 alphabets and each alphabet will describe the, the, the what, how our God is. And coming next to thanksgiving, that word itself explains, giving thanks to God for what he has done in our life. So look how he graduates from the baby department of prayer to a great graduate in the prayer department. So in our life, we have been put into situations and we have been blamed by others and they would have asked me uh, and we would have been blamed for others' fault. But how have we reacted? Have we been angry or have we been uh, sad, upset? Rather, have we asked God, what can I do about this situation? Just like Moses. Then moving on to the sixth stage, that is the prayer of 
obedience. We know the fight between the Amalekites and the Israelites. That fight still continues. There is a battle between the flesh, the people of flesh and people of God. And I always say still now that battle is there. The battle between the bed and the Bible, pillow and prayer. You know, once you see the bed and once you see the pillow, you feel so asleep and you can easily go into there. But that fight is always there. But what happened was when... Moses was on the mountaintop, Aaron and Hur, they were supporting him and they were putting stone tablets under his hand. So what they were doing is when he was going weary, Israelites were failing. So instead for the Israelites to win, they were giving stone tablets. I say that would recommend today's alarm clock. And you, you know, some people had sword in their hands. So I always say prayer is no substitute for fighting. In Nehemiah's time, we know the the walls were in ruin it took uh, ages for them to build it and you know when they were building it there was so much of opposition some people had trouble in their hands but some people had sword in their hands you know so you have to be very awake you have to be persistent in prayer you have to be importunate in prayer moving on the seventh point is the prayer of sympathy we can see Moses praying so that people will be saved from the wrath of God you know when he's coming down from the mountain top he is seeing the Aaron has made a calf made of gold and they were worshipping this golden calf and he could hear them uh, raising noise and voice and worshipping and enjoying and Moses had just come down from the mountain spending 40 days and 40 nights with God and God had written all the commandments on the stone tablet and when he comes down he breaks that tablet and he just cries out to God and he's saying Lord you have every right to be angry and 40 days and 40 nights he fell prostrate and he's crying with before God and he went to the extent of crying and it has touched my heart so many times he went to that extent he's praying God blot me out from the book of life but save them but the same prayer Paul is praying in Romans 9 3 let me be accursed for the sake of my brethren let me be accursed for the sake of my kinsmen we can see Paul praying what a boldness can we become like that you know John Knox prayed once God give me Scotland or else I die As Third prayed, if I perish, I perish. For such a time as this, God has raised you up. I believe each and every one who is on this platform, you all have a passion to become great intercessors. In the days to follow, God will make you great intercessors. That is my prayer. And I believe great intercessors will come out of you. And coming to the eighth point, God is speaking to Moses. And Moses is speaking to God as a man speaks to his friend. What a friendly approach. You know, in the burning bush experience, Moses, in the beginning stage, he was so afraid afraid to look at God's glory but Moses has grown so much earlier he was focusing on his weakness now he's focusing on God's power and he's begging Lord I want to see your face I want to see your glory look at him how he has changed from the beginning stage now he's a great graduate he's asking Lord I want to see your face and God is telling him no you won't be able to see me I'll pass through and you will see my backside and you know when he comes down from the mountain his face is ever so radiant and it's full of of glory sometimes when you see some people you say oh the, her face looks so graceful we can know praying people the time they spend with the Lord the communication and the intimacy they have with the Lord and coming to the last part that's the ninth part of an intercessory warrior that is the deepest part of prayer we can see Moses prophesying in Deuteronomy 18 18 Moses is saying God will raise up a prophet like Moses in the days to follow after my death there will come a prophet to lead you like Moses Moses is a prophet as well he is prophesying over his life we all are prophets of our own life if you look at me from the moment I was conceived in my mom's womb from that moment to this moment how God has led me it's all byproduct of prayer God is a prayer answering God he's a covenant keeping God and you know he has given us the word of God it's yes and amen all the promises are for us we are the children of God what a privileged community we are to serve such a living God so we should claim it it's yes and amen all the promises we should claim it in our life we should claim all the promises and it should come to fruition in our life so we can see the deepest part of prayer that is where he's uh, gave, giving up prophecy and coming lastly I always say Moses always prefigures Christ we can see Christ on Calvary crying for the sinners Christ on the cross saying Lord not my will let thy will be accomplished God crying out to the father Lord we had the glory once restore me back to the glory he is praying you know the high priestly prayer where he prays Lord there are people who are yet to know the father let them come to 
the Father's glory, to the Father's love. We can see Christ praying so that God will ordain prayer the mouth of babes and infants. That is what our Lord was doing on the cross. So I always say Moses prefigures Christ in so many aspects. Now, coming to intercession, what do I mean by intercession? Intercession means to stand in the gap. Ezekiel, the major prophet, he says, I look, and God says to Ezekiel, I looked for a man who would stand in the gap and I found no one. You know, in Abraham's time, he is bargaining with God. Lord, would you destroy Sodom if you find 10 righteous people? You know, he started from 50 coming down, down, down to 10. And God could not find 10 righteous people. And we know what happened to Sodom. It was completely destroyed. So intercession means to stand in the gap. That means to swap position, to take the position of your friend take their shortcomings, their sin, everything, come and beckon for God's mercy. There are two things that constantly go to the throne of God daily. Do you know what it is? One is accusation, what the devil does. Second is the intercession, the prayer of a persevering righteous person. And I always say you have to be careful of that. And in intercession, I always say there should be three eyes. The three concepts of intercession is, the first is intervention. What do I mean by intervention? To step into a situation with a divine purpose in mind to intervene. We know the kingdom of darkness is under our feet. We live as the children of kingdom of light. So we know there is an intervention. The second point is intersection. What is intersection? It's a place where two roads meet or it's a place where two paths meet. And then thirdly, there is interception with a C. That means to stop, to take over and reverse the direction of something that is happening. All these three happens when you intercede. You can reverse a situation. And I prophesy, I don't know what situation you are facing, what mountainous task is before you, but we serve a living God. If you pray, God will open ways and avenues for you, you know? And I like the verse where it says, with the faith like that of a mustard seed, with the minute, you can move the mighty, you can move the mountain, but all you need is to have the faith like that of a mustard seed. And I always uh, say that we live in a very consumeristic, materialistic society. There is a supply and there is a demand. There is a supply for the inexhaustible mercy of God, but there is a demand of the lost state of the world. But the connecting link, you know what it is? The connecting link always is intercession that will connect the supply and the demand. And intercession is not very easy. It's hard work. It requires lots of time. It, has, it is like praying through and through. Imagine Moses praying 40 days and 40 nights for the Israelites when they made the golden calf. He fell prostrate. How can you pray over one prayer request? Over over and over and over and over again but that is what intercession is praying through we all like to hit the punchline lord give me bless me bless my family that's it no 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 you have to pray through and through and god will teach you as you grow more and more deeply in his love and in his grace and i always like to quote um, psalm 90 which is the psalm of moses it's a prayer of moses and it begins by saying look at their friendship oh and he speaks lord look you are a creator how the mountains have been brought forth and i love the verse where it says lord you are everlasting to everlasting that means god transcends all time and i like a verse where it says lord teach us to number our days so that we gain a heart of understanding what a prayer of moses and you know god is still looking for intercessors in this generation and the three bedrocks of intercession which i found in the life of moses was he was he had a faith he had obedience and he was humble enough. He had the faith which was strong enough to see God face to face. He had an obedient heart and he, had, he was such a humble soul. All these three should be the bedrock of an intercessory warrior. And I believe in days to follow, like John Harper, like John Knox, great intercessors will come out of this generation. Let us stand in the gap. I know after this one hour, you will be uh, praying and pleading for the nation, for the blessing of the nation, for God to cure this nation. I know God will raise great intercessors. Let us pray for our family, our church, our nation. You know, you should learn the history of CT stud and everyone oh it's so amazing how God raised warriors in this in this generation so I pray and I believe God will raise a great 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 intercessors in this generation that is my prayer and in days ahead God will raise you up like a great intercessor to stand in the gap and to cry and to beckon for God's mercy for his 
inexhaustible supply of mercy and goodness. And I thank you all for listening to me. God bless you. Have a great week ahead. God bless.